Hi everyone. Consider the following system. An object just hanging from a string. So we've got a mass attached to a string. There are only going to be two forces acting on this system. There's the force of gravity that's pulling down on the object. And there's the force of tension in the string pulling upwards on the object. I'm holding it in place, but that's just what is actually generating this tension force. Me, you know, pulling up on this thing. So we're going to assume that there are no other forces acting on it. There's not going to be any air resistance or any other forces, just force of tension pulling up, gravity pulling down. And let's say at a particular moment, this object is moving upward. So if I start down here, then for this entire time, for that entire motion, it's moving upwards. If the object is moving upwards at a given moment, what can we conclude about the strength of the tension force compared to the strength of gravity? Think about this for a minute. Take a minute and even write down your answer once you have one. Again, all we're saying is we've got this object with just tension pulling up, gravity pulling down, and all we know is that the object is moving up in some way. What can we say about how the strengths of these two forces compare with each other? Do you have a definite answer? Because turns out if you have a definite answer, you are wrong. And this is related to a common misconception about how forces and motion are related to each other that we can start to solve with looking at Newton's laws. But again, it's a very, very common misconception, which is why I want to spend a little bit of time on it and do some experiments to demonstrate more of the subtleties of Newton's second law. So let's take a minute and talk a little bit about Newton's second law. Okay. So Newton's second law, the kind of modern form that we often talk about and introduce in intro physics classes, is that the net force is equal to the mass of the object times the acceleration. So what are all these terms specifically? So that F net is the vector sum of all of the external forces that are acting on the object. So again, in the case of this hanging object, it's just gravity pulling down and the tension force that was on that object pulling upwards. The object mass, well, that's, M is just the mass of the object in kilograms, and the acceleration, our rate of change in velocity, is in meters per second squared. Now, with this equation, you have to be very, very careful because this is a vector equation. And whenever we're talking about vector quantities, direction matters. Okay. So, in this equation, the net force is a vector saying what, not only what is the overall force acting on this object, but what direction is that force acting in. Uh, acceleration has a direction. Whereas mass, well, the mass of an object doesn't have any direction associated. If I say my mass is 85 kilograms, that's just a number. It's just a positive number. As far as we know, there's no such thing as negative mass. So since mass is a positive scalar value, this equation implies that the net force that's acting on the object is always in the same direction as the acceleration of that object. Well, what can we say about the direction of the acceleration of an object? Let's look at that in a little bit of detail as well. Our definition of acceleration is the rate that the velocity vector of some object changes with, with respect to time. So as time goes on, how is my, or how is the velocity of this object changing by? So for example, average acceleration is defined to be the change in velocity. This is the Greek letter delta, which just means change in. So the change in our velocity we generally measure changes by looking at the final value minus the initial value. So our change in velocity divided by the change in time. That change in velocity, if we're using standard metric units, that velocity and changes in velocity would be measured in meters per second divided by a time in seconds. So that gives us our acceleration in meters per second per second, or more commonly meters per second squared. But more importantly for this video, the direction of the acceleration, because again, this is a vector equation, the direction of this acceleration 
matches the direction in which the velocity of the object is changing. We have to be very, very careful with this definition because it's not saying that the acceleration is always in the same direction as velocity. The acceleration is in the direction that the velocity of an object is changing in. And when introducing these quantities, I recommend thinking of a couple of key introductory cases. So let's look at a few of those cases. If I have an object where the velocity and the acceleration are in the same direction, so whatever way the object is moving, whatever direction that velocity is, let's say the acceleration is in exactly the same direction. If that's the case, if they're in exactly the same direction, the speed of that object will increase and the direction of the motion will stay the same. So if I have an object where the object is moving to the right and the acceleration is to the right, it'll keep going to the right, but it'll keep going faster and faster. Next, let's think of a case where velocity and acceleration are in opposite directions. So this could be an object that is moving to the right, but the acceleration vector is pointing to the left. In that case, the object will, again, keep going in the same direction, but it's going to slow down. So if I have a case where an object is moving to the right, but slowing down, that means the acceleration is going in the opposite direction of that velocity. The velocity would be to the right, the acceleration would be to the left in that case. And just to complete this set, we're not really going to worry about this one too much for this particular video. If the velocity is perpendicular to the direction of the acceleration, or acceleration is perpendicular to the velocity, that will cause the direction of the object to turn. But if those are exactly perpendicular, if the velocity and acceleration are perpendicular to each other, the speed of that object will remain the same. So what does this have to do with our original question of saying, I've got an object hanging from a string with tension and gravity acting on it, and it's moving upwards. What does this have to do with that particular question? Well, everything really, because according to Newton's second law, the direction of the net force has to match the direction of the acceleration of the object. And let's think about what might happen if I just take this object, starting from some original position, and I lift it up, move it up for a little bit, and then I stop the motion. So let's look at what's happening during this kind of motion. And to map this out, again, we're looking at how that tension force is going to be changing during different parts of the motion. And let's try to graph this, saying what's happening to the tension force at different times. So we're going to start with this thing, just say on the ground, not moving, not accelerating, no motion whatsoever, no acceleration. So the forces are balanced. And at least at the very beginning of this motion, before we've done anything, the force of tension will match the force of gravity. Well, when I start to lift this object up, I'm going to have to cause this thing to accelerate. Originally, it's not moving. Later, it's going to be moving upwards at an increasing speed. So during that first part of the motion, when I'm lifting this thing up, at least during the first part, there's a period of upwards acceleration. The object is moving upwards, and the speed is increasing, which means the direction of the acceleration has to match the direction of the velocity. Both of those are gonna be pointing up. If the acceleration is pointing upwards, that means the net force is pointing upwards. And if the overall net force is pointing upwards, that means tension, the force of tension, has to be winning out over the force of gravity. So during that time, there's gonna be a little bit of a bump in our force of tension. Okay. So I start moving this thing upwards and eventually I'm gonna to get to an area where I'm just coasting upwards. We're gonna to get to a coasting phase where the object is moving upwards at a constant speed. If it's a constant velocity, the direction of the motion isn't changing and the speed of the object isn't changing. That means my velocity vector isn't changing with time, as long as both the direction of motion and the uh, speed of that motion, both of those are staying the same, then there is no acceleration. If there's no acceleration, that means the net force has to be zero. 
which means the tension and gravitational forces will balance each other out during this coasting phase. So during this period, we're going to be back to the case where that tension force just matches the force of gravity. And a couple other things about this. It doesn't matter what that upwards velocity is. I could be moving this thing up slowly, I could be moving this thing up quickly, as long as it's in that coasting phase where it keeps moving upwards, neither speeding up nor slowing down, then those forces are going to match each other. But then, eventually, I'm going to get this thing as high up as I can manage it, and I'm going to have to have this thing moving upwards, so it's moving upwards, but the speed is decreasing. I'm slowing down to a stop. So, when I'm slowing down to a stop, the object is still moving upwards. But since it's slowing down to a stop, its velocity is pointing upwards, it's slowing down, which means the direction of the acceleration has to be opposite the direction of the velocity. So, during that last slow down to a stop phase, the acceleration in that case is actually going to be pointing downwards. And if the acceleration points down, that means the net force is also pointing down, which means that if these are the only two forces acting on it, the force of gravity has to be winning out over the force of tension, which means that the force of tension is going to be less than the force of gravity. And when we actually graph this, there should be a downwards drop, at least temporarily, in that force of tension. Once the thing finally comes to a stop again, and we're not moving, we're not accelerating, no motion at all, then we're going to be back to that no acceleration, the forces are balanced, we'll get back to that force of tension matches the force of gravity. So this is what we're going to test. How are we going to test it? Well, I've got this pulley set up over here. I'm going to take an object, take a string, wrap it around the top of that pulley, and from that, I'm going to hang the force sensor. So I'm going to have the force sensor hanging from that. And the mass is going to be connected to that force sensor. Okay, so that's all going to be hanging. And basically, since the force sensor is connected in this way, it's basically measuring what is the upward force that is acting on this mass. So again, we've got gravity pointing downwards. And this force sensor is going to be measuring the upward force of tension during any of these motions. And by pulling on the other end of the string, using the pulley to hopefully smooth out that motion a little bit, we'll see how accurate we can make that, I'm going to be able to move this object up and, again, go through a phase where we are speeding up. We've got that upwards acceleration. We're going to have a coasting phase where it's moving up at as close to a constant speed as I can make it and then a slowdown phase at the top of that motion, and we're going to see whether the force sensor is actually able to measure these changes in the tension force. I'm also going to have a motion sensor set up on the ground, looking up at the hanging mass, so we're going to be able to monitor how accurately I'm able to get this thing to have the accelerating phase, the coasting phase, and then the slowing down phase. So we're going to be able to match up those motions and make sure that I'm not uh, uh, pulling this string in a way that doesn't match up with this description that I've given. A couple other things that we should just quickly check before diving into the experiment itself. First, we need the mass of this object, of the object that we're going to be using. So if we put that on the scale, that mass is 0.5. 5036 kilograms and to figure out the gravitational force that would be acting on that object we take that 0 0.5036 kilograms multiplied by 9.8 meters per second squared and that gives us around 4.935 newtons of gravitational force that's acting on the object let's check that against our force sensor. So when we have this force sensor just hanging here, I've tried to set up the string so it's pulling straight up on this. Might be a little bit off, hopefully not too off balance or anything like that. But when we attach the object, let's make sure that our force sensor is zeroed or pretty close to being zero. Then when we hang this and we don't have any acceleration, that should be around 
4.935. So again, if I'm moving my hand a little bit, there's a little bit of jitter there, but hopefully that'll be accurate enough for us to get some good measurements. Again, we're gonna be looking at how the force changes, how the, uh, during the entire times of the motion, when the velocity is increasing, when the velocity is staying the same during the coasting phase, and when the velocity is decreasing during each of those different parts. So let's set up the experiment. So again, for this setup, we've got the force sensor that's measuring how much force is pulling up on the hanging mass. Uh, and I'm going to be trying to pull on this string in such a way that we have a clean speeding up phase, a clean coasting phase where the velocity is constant, and we are going to be monitoring what that velocity actually is and whether or not we're getting close to a constant value during that coasting phase and a slowdown phase. So we're gonna be measuring the force at those same uh, instances and we're gonna see if that matches with our prediction. Notice that when I have this thing just sitting here, not accelerating, notice our force is fluctuating a little bit. We said based on the mass of this object, the force of gravity should be 4.93 or 4.94 Newtons. And that seems to be approximately what we're getting, you know, plus or minus a little bit of jitter that I have just trying to hold this thing steady. So let's start with some trials. We're gonna start, our first trial is going to be high acceleration, high top speed, and a rapid slowdown as well. So let's see what we get for the first trial. That one looks pretty good. Let's save that one as our first instance. So let's take a look at this first example and see whether or not our predictions match up with the actual results. So I'm gonna zoom in on this a little bit more so we can see this a little bit better. And again, we've got our graph for the force. Let's uh, scale some of these. We've got our graph for the force. We've got our graph for the uh, position, which we're not really gonna need. And we have our graph for our velocity. And let's look at these different segments. So the way that we're gonna do this is we're gonna highlight different segments. Uh, again, where the object is accelerating upwards, where we are speeding up, a section where we are coasting, and a section where we are slowing down at the end. Okay. So for the section where we are accelerating, if I highlight that same section of data and look at the statistics for that section, then notice our average force of tension during that accelerating phase is 7.61 newtons. In the case where we said it's at rest, that average force, that gravitational force that we should get when the thing is not accelerating at all, that should be around 4.93 or 4.94 newtons in that kind of ballpark. And during that upwards acceleration phase, we get that match very, very well. But what about the segments where the object is moving at approximately a constant velocity? Again, as close as I could make it by pulling on the string. Well, let's highlight that same section of data. And if we look at the statistics for that, well, we said that the force of tension during this coasting phase should match the force of gravity. That force of gravity, again, being the 4.93 or 94 Newtons. And we got 4.92, a very, very close match. That's like 0.2% off or something like that. What about the deceleration phase? Okay. So when this thing is slowing down, well, if I highlight that same section of data for the force data and look at those statistics, the average for that is only 3.22 newtons, much lower than the force of gravity. So when we compare these results with what we had for our predictions, well, these match up very well. When we are lifting the object during the speed up phase, the acceleration is up, which means the net force is up, which means the force of tension is winning out. During the coasting phase, even though with this data, we're moving at around one meter per second, even though we're moving at around one meter per second, the force matches, let me uh, switch this over, the force matches what we had for just the force of gravity when this thing was at rest. It matches very, very accurately. And then when we reached the top of the motion and had that slowdown period, 
uh, so the slowing down portion of the motion, then our force of tension is less than the force of gravity, and we did in fact get that dip in the value of the force as measured by that force sensor. Let's look at another uh, example. Here we go. High acceleration, high uh, top velocity. So this is another one of our trials, and let's uh, scale these graphs so we can get a good look at what's happening. This one we got up to an even higher top speed, but we still had that same pattern. During the acceleration phase of the motion, when we were starting to move upwards and the speed was increasing, well, that mean value for the force is significantly higher than what we had for the force of gravity. It accelerates upwards. Then during that constant motion, let me pick this particular section right here because during that section we seem to get a really, a, a fairly constant value for that velocity. It looks like it's around 1.3 or 1.4 meters per second. And during that section, if we look at these statistics, again, we were expecting 4.93 or 4. We got 4.91 in really good agreement within 1% of what we were expecting. Then we have the deceleration phase, and if I highlight that same section, we get that downward, uh, that dip in the measured tension force, down to 3.5 newtons of force. So again, those match up very nicely. Let's look at a few more scenarios. And let's try another one of these. So again, this is again, high acceleration, low top speed, and rapid deceleration as well. Okay, not too bad, we'll save that. Okay. I'm gonna try another one. I'm not sure how well this is gonna work, but I'm gonna try a low acceleration. It's gonna be hard to get that low acceleration enough to get to a higher top speed, but let's see what we get for, uh, for this one. So this is gonna be lower acceleration, it's going to be harder to kind of identify that from the force graph, but let's see what we can get. So here we go. Here we go. I think that one should do it. So this is the first of the set of trials where we had a high acceleration, but a lower top speed. And let me scale some of these graphs so we can see them in a bit more detail. Well, let's look again. During the accelerated portion of the motion, when our velocity, our upwards velocity is increasing, if I highlight that same section of the motion and look at the statistics, okay, during that motion, we get a higher value for the force of tension. We get that upward spike in the tension when it's accelerating upwards. But if we look at the constant velocity part of the motion, notice there was a slight little tick in the, uh, in the motion sensor, but we still get a pretty constant motion. Uh, if I look at that same section of data for the force, again, we were expecting around 4.93 or 4.94 Newtons, we got 4.92, again, within about, with within half a percent of what we were expecting to get. So very good agreement there. Again, we're moving upwards at around uh, 0.5 meters per second, but even though we're moving upwards, as long as we are not accelerating, the tension force and the gravitational force will just balance each other out. And once again, during the deceleration phase of the motion, if I highlight that same section of data for the force data, well, it's a little bit lower than what we had before, only 4.45 rather than 4.93 or 4. Let's look at another set of data. So this was our second trial where we had, again, a high acceleration but a lower top speed. Let's scale these graphs. Didn't quite scale the way that I wanted them to. There we go. Now we've got the graph scaled. Can do the same thing down here. 
Once again, during the accelerated phase of the motion, I don't think I even need to do the statistics for that one. We can clearly see that there is an upward spike in the force during that part of the motion. Then during that constant velocity part, again, it was a little bit of a hiccup with the, uh, with the motion sensor at that point, but we can basically look at that entire section of the motion and say, if we highlight that same section of data and look at the statistics, again, right on the money with what we're expecting for the gravitational force. During that coasting phase, even though it's moving up slowly, that tension force is matching the gravitational force. And during the deceleration portion of the motion, well, we get this downwards dip in that tension force. And that looks like it dips down to around 4.22 Newtons. So again, even though we have uh, uh, different top speeds during that coasting phase, as long as that velocity is constant, then the force is just going to be, the tension force is just going to be balanced with the gravitational force. Let's look at another case. Okay, so this was the first of our attempts at a low acceleration case. This was the one where I didn't really get a coasting phase in here, but let's still have a look at this data. And I'm going to shift this graph a little bit to get rid of those, those noisy parts. Let me see if I can just rescale this a little bit. And let's also scale this part, six and two, four for that, so you can see that. During the phase of the motion where we are accelerating, if I highlight that exact same section and look at the statistics, okay, during that upwards acceleration, the acceleration is upwards, which means the net force is upwards, which means the force of tension is a little bit higher than our force of gravity. Force of tension is around 5.35, force of tension is around 4.93 or 94 for that one. During the deceleration portion, again, we're not moving downwards. The object was moving upwards the entire time. It's just slowing down. So if it's moving upwards, but the speed is decreasing, that means the net force is pointing down. And if we look at the force data for that section of the motion, then we do in fact find that the tension force is less than what we had for our force of gravity. Tension force is only 4.57 Newtons. Our force of gravity is around 4.93. So for this one, this was again, low acceleration, low top speed, but this one I got the uh, coasting section a little bit better. So let's see if we can scale our graphs on here a little bit. So again, during the accelerated phase of the motion, even though it was a lower value for acceleration, we should have this being a little bit higher. That tension force is a little bit higher than our force of gravity, 5.11 again compared to 4.93. During the constant velocity motion, we're at around uh, 0.5 meters per second. During that constant velocity motion, if I highlight the same section of data, right on the money, 4.94 Newtons of uh, tension force, which matches the gravitational force. Then during the deceleration phase, well, we can just see the dip in that force, but let's look at it specifically. Uh, that tension force went down to 4.62 Newtons, again, compared to the 4.93. So once again, all of these cases where the object is being lifted, these predictions that we had for an object being lifted but starting at rest, in each one of those cases with higher accelerations, lower accelerations, with higher top speeds, uh, higher coasting speeds and lower coasting speeds, it's only during the section where the acceleration is actually pointing up where the force of tension is greater than the force of gravity. When it's moving up, even though it's moving up, if it's just coasting upwards, not speeding up, not slowing down, that means the acceleration is zero, which means those forces are balanced. And for all the velocities that we looked at from around uh, half a meter per second to one and a half meters per second, I think was around our highest. Even though it's moving upwards, 
it's not accelerating. And if it's not accelerating, that means the net force is zero. And that means the tension and the gravitational forces are balancing each other out. And only at the end, when the object is still moving upwards but slowing down, during that phase of the motion, acceleration is downwards, which means the tension force is less than the force of gravity. This is all direct predictions of Newton's second law. And again, it's a very counterintuitive thing. Because when you lift an object, you're always thinking, oh, I have to overcome gravity. So if it's moving up, the upward force of that's being applied to the object must be greater than the force of gravity. But we see that that is not necessarily the case. What matters is what direction is the object accelerating in. The object is moving at a constant velocity, doesn't matter how fast it's moving upwards. We couldn't test a huge range of velocities, but for the ones that we were able to test, we saw absolutely no sign that anything changes with the required tension force or the gravitational force that's acting on the object. So we've demonstrated that in this case where I'm taking an object and lifting it from rest, we can use Newton's second law, specifically the property that the net force and the acceleration are always pointing in the same direction, and our understanding about acceleration, namely that if acceleration and velocity are in the same direction, the object will speed up, and if the velocity and acceleration are in opposite directions, the object will slow down. We use those properties to successfully predict how the tension force will change during this motion of me lifting the object upwards. What if I change this system around a bit? What if instead of lifting this object starting from rest, what if I started with the object high up and I lowered the object? Okay. We've got the same forces acting on it. We've still got tension pointing up and the force of gravity pointing down. The only difference is instead of lifting the object, I'm starting at the top of the motion and the object starts moving downwards. It coasts for a little bit and then we bring it to a stop. I'd recommend trying to think through what this force of tension versus time graph is going to look like. During each of those parts of the motion, when we start moving the object down, when it's coasting down, and when it finally comes to a stop, what is our force of tension versus time graph going to look like? So I do recommend pausing the video and having a go at that yourself. Otherwise, let's just jump into this one. Well, during the first part of that motion, when we start to lower the object, it's moving down, its velocity is downwards, and for at least a brief period, its speed is increasing. Which means that the acceleration is pointing in the same direction as velocity. We have this downwards acceleration. If the acceleration is downwards, that means the net force on the object is downwards, which means gravity is winning out over the tension force. The tension force is less than the force of gravity. Then we've got the segment of the motion where this thing is just coasting downwards. It's not speeding up, it's not slowing down, it's not changing direction, which means for that segment of the motion, the acceleration is zero, which means the net force is zero, which means our tension and gravitational forces are balancing each other out. At the end of that motion, when we get to the bottom of the motion, we have to bring this thing to a stop. It's still moving downwards, but the velocity, the speed of the object is decreasing. So if the speed is decreasing, the direction of the velocity and the direction of the acceleration have to be opposite each other. So that would be an upwards acceleration, which means an upwards net force, which means for that segment of the motion, the tension force is winning out over gravity. And when we put all this information on the graph, then again, what we get is it starts moving downwards, so we get the downwards acceleration, tension drops down momentarily. Then we reach the coasting phase where there's no acceleration and tension and gravity will be balanced. Then we slow that thing to a stop. So if it's moving downwards but slowing to a stop, that means the acceleration is upwards and we get an increase, a temporary increase in that force of tension. So let's put this to the test. So again, moving downwards, We've got high acceleration to begin with, uh, high top speed, and rapid deceleration at the end. 
So here's the data from our first trial of lowering the object. So we'll make sure those are scaled nicely. And again, our prediction is that during that starting to lower phase, there should be a dip in the tension force. Then the downwards coasting, that force should be pretty much constant. Then when we slow to a stop, we should get an upward jump in the tension force. And let's look at what we have. So we have that it's accelerating downwards. The velocity is becoming negative for, for downwards. And we clearly get that drop in the tension force. So again, our gravitational force is around 3.9, sorry, 4.93 Newtons. And this tension force is only just over three Newtons of force. I didn't hold this perfectly constant, but this section over here, I held fairly constant at right around one meter per second. So let's analyze that section of the data. So that section of the data right there, we claimed that it should match up very well with the gravitational force. And when we look at this, dead on. We were expecting around 4.93 or 4, we got 4.95. So during that phase, even though it's moving downwards and just coasting, even though it's moving downwards, we still get that matchup between the force of tension and the force of gravity. So what about when we slow to a stop during this segment over here? So well, that slowing to a stop segment, if we highlight that same set of data and look at the statistics for that, yeah, that tension force is higher than the force of gravity that we were using. So that matches up very, very well with our predictions, but let's look at a few more trials. Let's try another case. Uh, downwards, high acceleration, high top speed, and rapid deceleration. So here we go. Let's do a high acceleration, but low uh, velocity, low coasting velocity. So let's try that as our next example. Looks pretty good. And here we go. So here we go. I think that'll work. So this was our next lowering trial. Again, a case where we had a higher acceleration and a higher downwards velocity. So during the period where we were starting to move downwards, a negative velocity faster and faster, we get this definite dip in the force. So this force is, uh, tension force is much less than the force of gravity. Then we get to this section where we have Again, I didn't get quite an exactly constant velocity, but reasonably close. Let's highlight that same section. So it is a little bit noisy, but let's see what we get here. And when we look at the statistics for this one, look at that. Nicely averages out to 4.95 or 4.96 compared to the 4.93 or 4 that we had for a force of gravity. Uh, again, all these forces are in Newtons. So during that a uh, constant velocity phase or approximately constant velocity when we were at around uh, 1.3 meters per second going downwards, we still get this match during the coasting phase between the force of tension and the force of gravity. Then we get that uh, slowing to a stop phase. So we're moving downwards, but slowing to a stop, which means the acceleration and the net force are up which means our tension force is winning out over gravity. 6.24 newtons compared to the 3. Point not, sorry, the, the 4.93 newtons for the gravitational force. Let's look at another case. So this is the first of the lowering trials where I tried to have a large value for the acceleration, but a lower coasting velocity. Once again, during that first downwards part of the motion, when it's accelerating downwards, we get a dip in that 
value for the tension force, as we were predicting. Then we get to this section where the, again, it's not quite constant velocity, but pretty close. Again, always going to be a little bit jittery. If we highlight that same section of data and look at the forces, well, we got around 4.92 newtons. Very good match with the force of gravity. And then during the deceleration phase, so especially right at the end there when that spikes up, looking at that part, we again get that increase in the tension force, and we get a tension force that is greater than the force of gravity, even though, again, this thing is moving downwards the entire time. Let's look at another example. Okay, so this was our second trial of having a larger value for the acceleration, but a lower top speed. Our top speed was only around 0.3 meters per second. During that acceleration downward phase, the force drops. During the constant velocity phase, well, let's, let's take that whole phase and look at the average force, 4.934. Can't get much more accurate than that for matching up this measured force of tension versus the force of gravity that we measured at the very beginning of the experiment. And then when this thing slows to a stop, well, that's when the force is going to spike for that part. So let's just get that data point as well. And that average force is around 5.29 newtons, higher than the force of gravity, exactly matching the predictions that we had from Newton's laws. Let's look at one more example. So this one was the case where I tried to have a lower value for the acceleration. So even though it's not accelerating much, we can still zoom in on this data and hopefully still get a little bit of a signal from this. So let's look at this section right here. This is going to be the, it's starting to move downwards part of the motion. If I highlight that same section and look at the statistics, well, it's not much lower than our force of gravity, but again, we have a very low value for this acceleration. There's a small downwards acceleration, which means there's going to be a small downwards net force, which means the gravitational force is only winning out a little bit over the force of gravity. If we look at the constant velocity phase. There might have been some vibrations going through the string. That's something that I've noticed happens uh, with this kind of system a little bit, but let's still highlight that data and see what we get for our... So highlight that section of data and see what we get for the average force. Again, pretty accurate despite some of the noisy data that force is matching with what we have for the force of gravity. The force of tension in this case is around 4.96 newtons, so a good match. And then, again, another low acceleration, slow to a stop phase. So if we highlight that section of the data and look at the force, it's a little bit higher than our force of gravity. Again, because we just had a low value for this upwards acceleration. Once again, even though the object was moving downwards the entire time, if it's moving down but the speed is decreasing, then the acceleration is pointing up, as is the net force. So let's talk about some conclusions for this. At the start of the video, we considered the question of how the upward tension force and the downwards gravitational force acting on a hanging object will compare if all that we know about the object is that it's moving upwards. The common misconception is that if the object is moving in a certain direction, then whatever force is pointing in that direction is going to be winning out. But one of the things that we can learn from Newton's second law is that when it comes to how forces that are acting on an object compare with each other, it's the acceleration that is important. Because the net force of an object and that object's acceleration always point in the same direction. Depending on whether the object is speeding up or slowing down, that will affect whether the acceleration points in the same direction as the velocity or the opposite direction of velocity. And in the case where we have an object that is moving with a constant velocity, where the speed of the object and the direction of motion of that object are both staying the same, the acceleration in that case is zero and the forces are balanced. We demonstrated that even when the object was coasting upwards at higher or lower speeds, or even coasting downwards, the force of tension matched the force of gravity. In those coasting cases, 
the acceleration is zero, which means the net force is zero, which means those two individual forces balance each other out. As an aside, we also demonstrated that the force of gravity acting on an object does not depend on how fast that object is moving. You know, in case anyone out there is mistakenly making that claim. We did this for a range of coasting velocities from around 1.5 meters per second up to around 1.5 meters per second going down, which is around a kind of a brisk walking pace. It's not super fast, so I, I couldn't make this thing move up or down a lot faster than that without uh, risking breaking the apparatus. But again, with that range of velocities, we found no evidence whatsoever for any change in the gravitational force. So keep that in mind next time someone makes that claim. Other than that, the common misconception that we introduced at the beginning of this video comes up a lot in different kinds of circumstances. Consider a jet flying through the air at a constant velocity. You might ask, how does the forward force from the jet's engines compare with the backwards force of air resistance? Well, if the speed and direction of the jet are not changing and there are no other forces, then those two horizontal forces will be balanced. That would be a coasting case. And there are a lot of similar scenarios that have these kinds of similar properties, but we can approach them all by understanding Newton's second law, that the net force always points in the same direction as the acceleration, and that the acceleration direction is not necessarily the same as the direction of motion. It depends on whether the object is speeding up or slowing down. So we'll call that good for this video. Hope it was interesting to people. Again, if you have uh, questions or suggestions for other video ideas, please leave those in the comments. If you're responding to other questions or comments, please try to be respectful and courteous to others. Thank you as always for the view and we'll see you in the next video.